Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. Uh, in 2002, the first mobile phone users in Uganda, Botswana and Ghana were observed settling debts by sharing or trading airtime with relatives and, and, or friends. So this were, th these were the first steps that later became, uh, the, uh, grew, grew into and was developed into the, the most successful payment system, mobile payment system in, in the development world, today known as M-Pesa. It was actually launched in, in five years later, 2007. But today it's, it's definitely the most successful one. I think it's a great example of how, uh, how the mobile technology can leapfrog help developing countries leapfrog Western world uh, uh, development. In 2012, the first Swiss payments were done in the Nordics. So in 2002, the first people, cell phone users in Africa, used uh, the, the you know, simple methods. Could someone help uh, <coughs> open the door? Thank you. In 2012, <laughs> 10 years later, we did the same thing in the Nordics. I think that's fascinating and, and serves as a good example of how the development world can actually quantum leap uh, development. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bridge Talk number 18. Uh, we're thrilled uh, for this special occasion to have this opportunity. Uh, I would like to start by saying thanks to our sponsors today, Nano Lund, uh, Medicon Village, where we're at, Sparbank and Syd, and not the least, uh, say our confidence. And uh, say hello to all of you watching on, on Facebook uh, uh, live stream as well. Um, the, the Bridge Forum, for those of you who are not aware, uh, are on a mission to connect science with business and societal development to push humanity forward towards the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Goals, the Agenda 2030. Goal number three is uh, ensuring healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages is one of those goals and one of the targets for goal three is to reduce by one-third the premature deaths of uh, non-communicable diseases for one one of the targets for goal three the director general of the world health organization uh, margaret chan dr margaret chan has said that uh, finding early diagnosis or rapid point of care analysis or testing is one of the keys to actually addressing this uh, in, a, in a successful fashion. It will contribute to goal number three in a very substantial way. So it's at the top of the, the agendas uh, and that is why we are extremely happy to have this opportunity to, uh, to connect science, the science of turning cell phones into advanced microscopy. Uh, and efficient point of care analysis uh, with this global need for early diagnostics. So here to talk about uh, his work leading the bio and nano photonics lab at UCLA, Professor Eiligan Oscham. A warm hand. So thanks for, uh, for having me, thanks for this warm uh, welcome. It's my great pleasure to be here today and uh, share with you uh, uh, <clears throat> some of our work also um, for those of uh, us uh, who are watching uh, through uh, Facebook channel, also welcome. <clears throat> so once again, thanks, thanks for having me. I, it's, it's my first time uh, uh, in Lund and, and uh, it's a beautiful place. I look forward to uh, spending the rest of this week uh, here. Uh, interacting with your colleagues. So my lab is working on um, uh, computational imaging and sensing technologies with an aim to democratize advanced measurement tools. A lot of times we have great resources in our labs, in our hospitals, uh, but that comes uh, at the expense of an infrastructure and capital and, and personnel. So I'm trying to actually, with, with our lab, uh, democratize advanced measurement tools so that they would work in field settings cost effectively uh, and in a mobile environment, performing the same task that you expect from advanced uh, instrumentation. 
So these are some examples from, from our lab. Um, I'll use the mouse as a, as a pointer. Um, so it's come a long way thanks to smartphones, thanks to mobile phones. Mobile phones are now a platform. They're very advanced in terms of their um, imaging and sensing capabilities. And we've been tapping into this resource to bring advanced measurement tools to be integrated with mobile phones. What you see here are some examples. Um, maybe 10 years ago, we could barely see a red blood cell with a smartphone or with a phone-based uh, microscope. Barely see a red blood cell, which is about one-tenth of the human hair in terms of uh, its diameter. But nowadays, actually, uh, you can create fluorescence or bright field microscopy tools to be integrated with smartphones to the level where you can see individual viruses, bacteria, even single DNA molecules can be seen through uh, uh, microscopy tools that are 3D printed inexpensively attached to a smartphone based system. This one is actually a fluorescence and dark field microscope. Um, that's using a smartphone and some optomechanical interface at the back. Handheld, very inexpensive. And these are some images <coughs> that are captured with this system. Uh, these are after a very simple silane chemistry based sample preparation. We stretch DNA molecules and um, insert them at the back of this uh, at attachment. And these are actually some images captured with the cell phone showing you individual DNA molecules that are um, labeled with cell fluorophores. Nicely matching to a benchtop, fairly expensive optical uh, microscope as shown here. And we can not only image these uh, molecules, but also size them with about one kilobase pair sizing accuracy, which is quite relevant for bringing genetic testing. For example, copy number variations uh, for drug resistance. Uh, this kind of a device could be able to measure uh, those, uh, those variations uh, at the gene of, for example, um, malaria or TB. In a recent work, uh, in collaboration with actually a Swedish group from Stockholm, uh, we created a multimodal microscope that is attached uh, to a smartphone. This one that you see over here it's actually a bright field microscope and a fluorescence microscope together where you can see uh, samples at two different fluorescence channels. We combine this with <clears throat> a, an amplification uh, uh, strategy known as rolling circle amplification, <clears throat> which basically um, amplifies DNA and forms clusters based on a template. In this case, uh, we were having mutant and wild type generate through uh, rolling circle amplification two different clusters of DNA where each one was labeled with a different fluorophore. So using this we've actually uh, uh, tested this device on colon cancer patients for looking into targeted DNA sequencing and in situ mutation analysis at tissue level. Uh, read through essentially uh, a smartphone. So you can actually bring some of the next generation uh, uh, sequencing needs to be read by these inexpensive microscopy tools bringing, again, the functions of an advanced hospital to uh, an inexpensive uh, uh, readout platform. Again, thanks to the advances in optics of uh, uh, smartphones and how we can utilize that to build uh, competitive uh, instrumentation. Sometimes, as I've shown you, we take the smartphone and build on top of that to create a platform for microscopy and sensing. But sometimes we also take the imager chip out of the smartphone and build another system around it. Not necessarily integrated with a smartphone, but capitalizing on the CMOS imager. That's the uh, silicon chip that we have at the back of our smartphones. Um, typically, one of those silicon chips will be half a centimeter by half a centimeter, a shiny chip that has many pixels um, uh, uh, on it. So you take it and actually create a computational microscope to do transmission imaging of specimen, spatially relevant to pathology. For example, this one is benefiting from economies of scale created by smartphones uh, to utilize an advanced CMOS imager off a smartphone to do billion pixel microscopy, gigapixel microscopy, using computation in a handheld format. If you look inside one of these microscopes, it's actually not the traditional light microscope that you know. This is a lensless holographic microscope. It's a computational microscope. Basically, if you look inside, you'll be seeing that the main component here is just this 5, 10, 20 megapixel imager that is at the heart. So that's the same thing that you capture a digital image with, except there's no lens in front of it. It's just 
bare uh, imager. Very inexpensive. A few cents to uh, maybe a dollar, depending on what kind of an imager you, you have. You place the sample right here. It goes above the CMOS imager, maybe a millimeter, sub-millimeter between the sample to sensor. So if it's essentially, let's say you have a blood smear, pep smear, it just goes in front of the CMOS imager. The gap between the two is not very important. So it's about a millimeter or sub-millimeter typically. The rest is just the illumination unit here. We have some 20 LEDs in here to do super resolution in this case. Super resolution means, let's say I have a pixel size here of one to two micron. Most of your smartphones, if you open them up, each pixel at the back of that silicon chip is about a micron to two microns. That's very small, it's great, but it's not enough to do high-end microscopy. What we want to do is actually divide them into smaller, digitally, smaller pixels. So there's a, essentially a nice framework here that's called pixel super resolution that digitally takes um, a few images by turning these LEDs on and off and acquiring maybe 10 frames to uh, uh, take that 10, 20 megapixel and convert it into a, 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 a thousand megapixel, a gigapixel imager. This is based on imaging of shadows. This is not your traditional light microscope. This one is imaging holographic shadows. So, for example, if you take your hand and bring it close to the table, there's light source about, you will see a shadow of it, right? It's the same principle here. We are detecting shadows of a specimen. For example, if I load onto that silicon chip a tissue sample, this is what we'll be getting. This is the raw image coming from that silicon chip. It is the diffraction shadow of these, uh, uh, these cells or tissue constituents. This is a, a thin histopathology slide. Only after some computation and phase retrieval, optical phase retrieval, you can actually time reverse these and go back to the actual image of the cells and the tissue that make up this, um, uh, this slide. So it's, it's, a, it's essentially a very simple microscope, but the simplicity is mitigated through computation so that these holographic shadows are uh, uh, reconstructed to give you uh, these, uh, these images. This is a comparison in terms of size and complexity and uh, field portability. It's as tall as this, this smartphone, and um, uh, you can manufacture one of these things, thanks again, uh, the state of smartphones, for a few hundred dollars, and um, it will be uh, a field portable, operated by a simple laptop or maybe a server. This is an earlier generation of these lensless chip scale uh, microscopes. And what, what I'm showing here uh, is a comparison of our images with respect to a state-of-the-art microscope for a blood smear that contains malaria parasites. So this is a standard microscope. These uh, are Ginza stained um, parasites, plasmodium false sperm, that's infecting the red blood cell. And this is how it looks under our, um, uh, our computational microscope, beautifully revealing unhealthy cells as shown here. One of the major advantages of this platform, in addition to being compact, cost-effective and field portable is its field of view. We can look at large areas. If you're ever stuck with a needle in a haystack problem, trying to find rare events over a very large volume or a, or a sample field of view, this kind of a microscope is great for you. So this is actually looking at a very large area. How large? 20 millimeters square, 30 millimeters square, 100 fold larger than a traditional light microscope. You can zoom in and find, in this case, malaria infected cells. This would be good for diagnostics, but also good for therapy because a lot of times there's drug resistance, so the gold standard for understanding if something is working or not is looking into parastemia. So the field of view sample area advantage is highlighted here. This is actually a, a standard uh, lens-based microscope. Let's say this is a 40x objective lens. This is typically the field of view that you would be able to look at. With 20x, you can look at a larger area at the cost of, uh, at the cost of resolution. This is our field of view. This is essentially a lensless um, chip scale on chip microscope field of view. It's rectangular because the silicon chip is rectangular. So it's about 20, 30 millimeters square. Any one of your smartphones, if you donate your chip to me, I'll be able to do microscopy using that at a, a sub-micron level across a field of view of about 20 to 30 millimeters square. Roughly speaking, half a centimeter by half a centimeter. So again, raw data cannot be understood by us. We're not trained to look at these. But after reconstruction, which is extremely rapid, 
which nowadays is also done by uh, a deep neural net, extremely fast. You can get these beautiful reconstructions nicely matching to what you expect from a standard lab-grade microscope. You can also do color. Color is very important in pathology. This is an h &E stained lung pneumonia uh, sample, sub 10 micron thick tissue that's stained. Again, the field of view comparison is shown here. This is our field of view thanks to the uh, silicon chip. You can zoom in and continue zooming in to show subcellular features of this kind of a microscope, which can generate diffraction with imaging across a very large field of view, generating easily about a billion useful pixels depending on the sensor that you have. So far, I've been showing you results that were acquired with literally smartphone um, CMOS imagers, the same things that we have at the back of our smartphone cameras. And uh, most of them were manufactured in this, in my example, by, for example, Sony. And this is the signature of the field of view. <clears throat> this is a, about a millimeter square. This is a pep smear. You can understand that you have a significant field of view advantage. But you're not only limited to smartphone cameras or smartphone uh, silicon uh, <coughs> CMOS imagers. You can also switch to CCDs, large format uh, charge coupled devices that are used, for example, in telescopes or high-end digital cameras. This is a framework, black box, so to speak. Depending on your imaging need, you can actually replace the um, uh, imager with a CCD with a large format one. Let's look at, for example, this one. This one is from Kodak. It was from Kodak. It doesn't exist anymore, but uh, <laughs> they were the best in CCD technology, but they unfortunately uh, couldn't make enough money out of it. They missed the cell phones. Uh, so uh, this is actually a CCD, which has about a 6.6 .6 micron pixel pitch. As you can see, it's a centimeter scale bar. You can do snapshot imaging of about 18 centimeters square field of view here which is about a thousand-fold larger than a traditional light microscope, which we'll be looking at these tiny circles over here. It's a traditional light microscope field of view, one of those circles. Of course, the resolution is not as good as what you get with CMOS technology, because in general, CCDs have bigger pixel size, like as I said, about, in this case, about six, seven microns. But still, your resolution is better than that, because we do pixel super resolution and digitally divide individual pixels to sub-pixels. Here we have about 1.5 gigapixels, uh, useful pixels in this image. One of the most important things is that you don't trade off resolution with field of view. In a traditional light microscope, the minute you want higher resolution, you sacrifice your field of view and volume, vice versa. These kinds of microscopes are different. It works with a different kind of principle. Let's say I have a 10 megapixel or a 20 megapixel imager, let's say 20 megapixel imager, with a certain pixel size. Next year, I got 40 megapixel because mobile phone users want to see more megapixels for some reason. Then I double my field of view without a sacrifice in resolution. If next year I have smaller pixel size and uh, more megapixels, I can improve both resolution and field of view at the same time. So these are some very unique aspects of, of this framework. These were some static samples that are of interest, like pathology samples, blood smears, pep smears. Anything transmissive can be imaged with this kind of a platform with a large throughput. At the same time, there are some more unique um, elements to this technology that make it very competitive. This is not just a miniaturization effort. This is not just making microscopes simpler, mobile, cost-effective, that you can carry around. It has also some very interesting elements to it that pushes the uh, frontiers of optical microscopy. Enables things that we cannot image with traditional light microscopes, no matter how expensive they are or how bulky they are. A great example of this I'll show in the next slides. This platform looks at large volumes and can be used to track locomotion in a high throughput second to none. In this example, I'll show you results where we um, look at sperm locomotion by putting them on top of a silicon chip and without any boundaries, very large pool of uh, volume, we're tracking their locomotion using lensless microscopy at its heart. It's a little bit different. The goal here is to understand the precise motion of sperms in 3D with sub-micron total localization accuracy. But at the same time, I, I want to do this with more than a thousand sperms in, in, in parallel. 
So, if you place a, spe a, a semen specimen on top of a CMOS uh, imager and shine light with two different colors at two different angles that are simultaneously firing, illuminating the sample, you record holograms at red and uh, blue uh, wavelengths. And we use that to triangulate the position of the sperm as it's moving up and down in, in X, Y, and Z. You would assume that the imager here is a color imager, just like how we capture photographs. In fact, it's not. It's a monochrome. It's colorblind. We use color here to computationally refocus and defocus one perspective from the other. This is a monochrome sensor. The wavelength is utilized computationally to be able to tell what is the vertical perspective of those sperms versus what is the oblique perspective. You can digitally separate them out based on red and blue wavelengths being far apart from each other. And then, once you have the two perspectives, you can pinpoint where each sperm is at a given time point. This is a very uh, uh, extremely high throughput microscope. We can look at about 10 microliters of sample volume, about more than three uh, orders of magnitude larger volume than a standard light microscope. Here you have more than 1,500 sperms. Colorful things are their trajectories in time, and color represents time, which is about 11 seconds of, of, of each sperm's locomotion. This one is one of those uh, 3D trajectories that we've captured. It's coming from a human sperm. It's about a second of its motion. Again, color represents time. We see that this is a helical sperm. Because sperms are not bounded in space, we have a large observation volume, they can freely uh, do whatever they want. In this case, the sperm head is doing 10 rotations per second. And this is the front weave of the sperm. It's a beautiful uh, circle in time and, and conducting a helix. This happens extremely rare in vitro. Four to five percent of the sperms we found, human sperms, conduct this. It's also common in, in, in uh, animals. So it's a unique observation that's enabled by the computational element of, of this microscope. And we can actually image thousands of these and understand 3D uh, locomotion patterns of sperm and, uh, and uh, use that as a, as a biomarker of health. In fact, NIH is funding us to spin off a company, which is already established, to bring this technology for um, a male fertility analysis to understand uh, the quality of uh, uh, sperm with a very inexpensive system that can be used um, even at the home. So that rather than going to an IVF clinic, uh, couples uh, that um, want to have kids would be able to uh, monitor the quality of sperm uh, even with very inexpensive systems. This one, you, you're wondering what this is, right? This is a helical ribbon. This is actually a new discovery enabled by this platform. This is a horse sperm, which is having a zigzag pattern, but the plane of that sinusoidal zigzag is having the form of a helical ribbon. So again, color represents time. This is a very unique and delicate, but a mathematically very rich uh, 3D locomotion that was happening there for centuries in vitro. But uh, couldn't be seen by traditional light microscopy tools because light microscopy tools cannot see in 3D in large volumes. This one is a 3D locomotion. The, the norm today for using um, uh, microscopes for looking at uh, locomotion and sperm is mostly attaching the sperm head onto a substrate so that it doesn't move away from the focus. Here, it's free because we uh, computationally bring everything into focus and reveal a, a complex pattern like this, uh, which again is a discovery in the sense that um, this has not been reported before, before, uh, before our work which is showing the, uh, uh, the fact that it's not just miniaturization, it's also enabling us to look at extremely delicate and precise uh, uh, locomotion patterns in 3D at a very large throughput, about uh, three orders of magnitude wider, uh, sorry, uh, larger volumes. This is actually a, another very interesting one, which is a bovine sperm. We've been playing with this platform, and it's fair to say that we've generated more data than the last century generated because of the throughput that we have. Within a few hours before the sperms die, we generate a lot of 3D locomotion patterns. So this is the sperm head, the black dot in here. It's conducting a beautiful uh, helical pattern, slightly irregular. And this is the uh, sperm's fl flagellum. Uh, it's at about 300 frames per second, uh, lensless chip scale microscopy result. You may be wondering what this orange 
red and green uh, arrows refer to. That is the local coordinate system of the sperm that we've identified. We're just putting there to show you that the sperm head is having a self-spin. Its, its head is spinning around its own axis. Uh, and we can measure all the uh, spin parameters. And again, this is the first time that these features are observed in a freely moving sperm thanks to uh, the computational uh, microscopy tools that we have uh, seeing 3D all at the same time over a large sample volume. Of course, we do not know under what conditions um, these types of locomotion patterns are activated. It must be very costly energy-wise for the sperm to, to have the head spin. We do not see it all the time. Um, it remains to be explored what, what triggers those kinds of um, uh, uh, switching behavior to these kinds of more energy-consuming uh, patterns. I but think it's a search pattern because it is very similar to a torpedo looking for a submarine under the water. So it, it's a search pattern, sure, but um, the sensor there can sense without the head spin, right? Okay. So uh, it's not just the search itself, because if I'm searching, I wouldn't uh, consume energy with the head spin, because I can smell it or I can uh, 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 have a chemotaxis behavior without that. So maybe at that time, the strength of the gradient is so strong that the sperm believes it's very close to the egg, because this might be providing an advantage to penetrate through the egg. But anyways, these are things that, that are speculations that need to be uh, uh, justified. But in a nutshell, this is a platform that provides some unique observations in 3D, even at the nanoscale. Sperm head, the sperm tail, the flagellum there, at some point it goes sub 200 nanometers, and it's beating extremely rapidly in a liquid environment. It's very, very, very difficult to see a 200 nanometer or sub 200 nanometer flagellum that is beating extremely rapidly. So it requires signal noise ratio and 3D imaging capabilities. In addition to microscopy, uh, we're also very much interested to democratize sensing tools. So we've done a lot of work on uh, using the smartphone as a sensor. For example, these are some of the earlier generations of um, sensors that were targeting uh, waterborne pathogens. This is actually a sensor that's based on um, some surface chemistry. It might be hard to see, but there are some capillaries here. Um, you can see the end of the capillary here. Those are actually capturing E. coli fragments, and uh, after a secondary labeling, they glow. Uh, and the amount of glow uh, correlates with the E. coli concentration in this example, using it actually as a front end to read some of the sensing principles. This one is a later work, uh, which was focused on this is a fluorescence microscope, which is specifically geared toward uh, detection of Giardia cysts. Giardia cysts are waterborne pathogens, and they are resistant to chlorine. They have a very uh, thick cell wall. As a result, they survive in cold weather up to six months, and they're uh, resistant to chlorine as well. That's why, especially, the uh, U.S. Army is very much interested in building tools uh, that, that detect Giardia cysts. This one has a front end here, which... Uh, you can put uh, a few milliliters of water. It has a porous membrane that is just enough for everything to pass, but GRD assists to remain on the membrane. There is a secondary fluorescence uh, uh, labeling, which then this disposable cartridge goes at the back of the smartphone, and it's imaged by this fluorescence microscope, which then goes to a laptop or a remote server. Because GRD assists have this uh, elongated shape, like a rugby ball at the micro scale, we have some... Um, machine learning to recognize uh, their uh, signatures. So there are a few different levels of specificity for this kind of a sensor, mechanical separation based on size, fluorescence tagging based on antibodies, and then finally the morphology of the fluorescence sign signatures. Uh, it gives us about a one colony forming unit per mil level of sensitivity for this kind of a system uh, in field settings. Some of the examples are shown here. This is actually uh, a heavy metal, heavy metal detector using nanoparticles. Once there's, uh, in this case, mercury-2 ions in drinking water, we see a red, red shift in the spectrum. This can achieve a, a very good three to four nanogram per mil level of sensitivity, parts per billion level of sensitivity for detecting mercury-2 ions. The test cost here is, uh, is about two cents per test, so it's very inexpensive, a very simple attachment. 
using spectroscopy and nanoparticles to sense heavy metals in this case. Some other examples are shown here. This one is actually um, a well plate reader. Um, some of you, at least, who are in life sciences might be using 96 well plates frequently. It's a high throughput screening platform, especially very valuable for microbiology applications. We created a reader for uh, well plates. Um, typically, well plate readers are like uh, maybe a printer sized devices. Uh, because the size of the well plate is very large, for example, this is a picture of it. Um, there are 96 wells in here. Each one of them is a separate reaction chamber. Typically, this goes into a printer sized device and literally it's scanned to be imaged one by one by a scanning optical system. We created here um, a snapshot imaging system based on fiber optics. Basically, we map in a single snapshot all the area of this large plate into a fiber bundle, which is then imaged, um, pr providing, this is a, a centimeter here, providing a beautiful demagnification. And these fibers contain all the information for each one of these reaction chambers. This device, we not only built it, but also we actually translated this to our clinical microbiology lab at UCLA to be tested with about 1,100 patient samples. So uh, there's some, some uh, background processing and machine learning to understand how those uh, individual fibers correspond to signal for each uh, reaction chamber, each well. We tested this with four different FDA-approved uh, IgG assays for uh, uh, immunization, mumps, measles, HSV-1, and HSV-2. And we've shown that we're on par with an FDA-approved reader for, for these tests, uh, validated with clinical data with, with uh, several hundred patients. So this is showing you that it's not just, again, miniaturization. It's also providing relevant data as good as you expect from an FDA-approved uh, device that's being used in literally uh, uh, in, in, in a hospital to serve patients at UCLA in this case. Uh, a similar idea applies to some other tests that need to be read by experts. So another test that we applied the same well plate reader is for understanding, understanding an antimicrobial resistance. So um, to prescribe the correct antibiotic to the patient with the correct dose, there's a test at UCLA and many hospitals that, that uh, microbiologists conduct. Um, they, they want to understand the minimum inhibitory concentration, which is actually working with also a 96 well plate format. What you have in here is a spatial plate of the same 96 well plate format, where you have here something like 15 to 20 different antibiotics, depending on your hospital, your, where you are in the world. For a given uh, bacteria, type of bacteria, you have a plate predetermined for it. In this case, you're looking at 19 different antibiotics at different concentrations uh, um, uh, put in this array uh, from, let's say, a lower concentration to a higher concentration, uh, an array of these, uh, trying to understand what concentration and antibiotic co combination uh, inhibits the growth of bacteria. And depending on that panel, essentially, microbiologists will be prescribing the minimum inhibitor concentration that that person should be getting. Believe it or not, the gold standard for this today is a trained MS level, master's level diagnostician, looking after 24 hours uh, a readout of this plate. It's, it goes into an incubator after 24 hours. It's read by a trained diagnostician, in this case my colleague is here, literally looking at turbidity or not for each well and getting the minimum inhibitor concentration for these um, antimicrobial susceptible testing uh, results. That again goes back to the uh, diagnostician. We've shown that we can actually automate this, and again, for a few hundred, using a few hundred different uh, patient samples, we've shown that without any major errors or very major errors, these are FDA uh, 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 criteria, we were uh, matching the results that are coming from um, uh, the expert diagnostician in this case. So, uh, it's showing you a great example of how something like a, a, a well plate reader can be simplified to make it really feel portable and very inexpensive to replace sometimes trained diagnosticians in an automated manner or sometimes these printer sized devices to read uh, ELISA tests or other kinds of um, uh, tests that are frequently read with uh, high throughput 96 well plates. So, uh, 
Uh, these are some examples of, 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 of how we've been utilizing smartphones and computation to uh, advance our capabilities for mobile sensing, for mobile imaging, and providing essentially useful tools, in a nutshell, to democratize advanced measurement tools so that they perform as expected from a high-end instrument, as good as you expect from a high-end instrument. Um, this is um, a, a recent uh, center that we have from U.S. National Science Foundation, which is um, a 10-year effort. I just wanted to uh, also share this with you. It's uh, four different universities, including UCLA, uh, Texas A&M, Rice University, and Florida International, uh, as a consortium uh, funded by uh, NSF that we will be working for the rest uh, of the decade, roughly, uh, to bring essentially advanced technologies uh, for cardiovascular disease and diabetes where it starts from development of essays, uh, wearable, uh, watch-like devices uh, to have vital signs and some sensing activities, as well as uh, point-of-care readers, uh, wearable readers to quantify those signals, uh, at the same time some machine learning and data analytics and clinical decision-making decision and working with communities. We're targeting uh, in this consortium uh, that's funded by NSF uh, at about $40 million uh, in total um, we'll be specifically focusing on underserved populations in the United States, uh, underrepresented uh, populations, so that we can bring cost-effective solutions for, especially to uh, risk factors, uh, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular uh, uh, diseases. So this is something that's uh, ongoing. We just started, actually, we're still in our second year of this uh, center. So um, in the second half of my talk, I'll come to... Uh, some of the more recent generations of technologies that we're working in regarding in regards to uh, mobile microscopy and computational imaging and sensing and, and uh, share with you how we've been benefiting from deep learning, uh, deep neural nets to enhance our imaging and sensing capabilities. So if you look today, there's a very strong symbiotic relationship between professionals and, and machine learning in general. Our instrumentation, our images that we create, whether it's optical or other uh, frequencies, they're getting better and better exponentially. We're spitting out more and more pixels, exponentially growing in number of pixels and voxels. But our diagnosticians and, and professionals who are supposed to look at those images, are unfortunately, are not <clears throat> advancing their capabilities uh, the, the same way. This creates a, a, a bottleneck. This creates a fundamental uh, 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 bottleneck, right? So we have more images than our diagnosticians can, uh, can uh, uh, handle. That's where actually machine learning can triage a lot of these images. And that's actually a great use for machine learning to give the experts the most relevant uh, information to look at. Among billions and billions of pixels and voxels, what are the most useful few tens of megabytes of data that you can deliver to the diagnostician? That's where I think uh, we've seen a lot of success stories from machine learning and specifically deep learning coming into place. <clears throat> Whether it's detection of tumor margins, cl classification of different stages of tumor, etc. These have been great success stories for the last at least 10 years for deep neural nets to make real impact coming uh, actually uh, very useful uh, at this junction between uh, machine learning and professionals. But I'd like to today talk to you about another very exciting opportunity, which is uh, at the front end. How deep neural nets can help us to enhance new images to be generated. Rather than acting on an image created by one of these previous modalities, how can we actually bring machine learning and data analytics to improve our images and enhance this uh, front end experience? That's a very exciting area that my lab has been working on over the last several years to make some interesting uh, contributions to. And I'll start with actually uh, some image transformations uh, and image reconstruction that uh, uh, we, uh, we established using the neural net. I've shown you at the beginning <clears throat> some microscopes that are working based on holography. So these were holographic microscopes and we spent maybe several decades, not just myself, but as a community, to find better ways to reconstruct those holograms. 
how, to, how do you take a hologram and reconstruct it? This was, the, at the previous decades, this was handled by physics, our understanding of light matter interaction, wave equation, Maxwell's equation. Knowing f the physics of that enabled us to invert holograms and, and uh, bring crystal clear images that we know how they should look, right? But now, from physics-driven solution spaces, we're migrating to data-driven, image data-driven solutions. It's an alternative to actually uh, physics-driven solutions. And I'll share with you some of the unique aspects of this kind of a framework. So in a nutshell, we'll, we'll teach some physics to a neural net through image data. This is the same hologram that I've shown before. It's a tissue section. With a holographic microscope, you can only see these uh, speckle patterns, interference patterns. Only after phase retrieval, as I mentioned earlier, you can go back from these holographic patterns into uh, spatial patterns of interest to the diagnostician, to the expert. Yes, so we have built various different tools. This is not to go over these uh, different physical uh, tools, but there are numerous methods that employ our understanding of physics to reconstruct these images so that you can take images that look like this, crowded and ha have lots of uh, interference artifacts, and create actually something that has the useful features. This is a pep smear sample showing you actually uh, the features of interest. Why do we care for a deep neural net to attack this problem? So, deep neural nets take a while to train. That is true. You need good quality data. That's also true. But that's a one-time effort. You have the data, that's good quality. And you have time to train, maybe uh, half, a, uh, half a day or a day, doesn't matter. After it's trained, the machinery of, of uh, the deep neural net is very simple to execute, to in theory. It's a very fast, single feed forward system. A lot of reconstruction that I've shown you before, they're actually iterated. Physics-based solutions always guess, have an error, correct the error, guess again, so refine it. So there are some iterations going on in physics-based reconstruction methods where now you can actually replace them with a single feed forward, rapid reconstruction, hologram in, result out, very fast. That's why we like it very much. And at the same time, it provides some very unique elements. I won't go into the details, but this is a convolutional neural net. Okay, so I should speed up. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a convolutional neural net, which is uh, um, a very modest neural net that we train with a certain uh, uh, penalty function. Um, and um, let me sh uh, go over uh, some of the results uh, for, for something like this. So at the left here, you have this hologram, which needs to be reconstructed. Uh, traditionally, you reconstruct it with some physics-based reconstruction methods. In this case, this is the ground truth. This is coming from eight different hologram acquisitions, uh, a lot of redundancy, so that we really converge to the ground truth. This is actually how, from a single input, the network calculates the same without any phase retrieval, the same result matching what the neural net, what the physical uh, ground truth uh, is, uh, is giving you. So you're actually mimicking that reconstruction that was physics-based through the machinery of the neural net in this case. But there are also some differences. For example, if you point to uh, these yellow arrows here, there are some features that do not appear in the network's output. These are actually out-of-focus particles. This was a pep smear. It's a Papa Nicolau smear taken from the surface of a patient. There were some out-of-focus particles in the optical path. Physics-based reconstruction treats them as reality because they are real objects. Unwanted, but they're really uh, dust particles in your optical path. So you see the signatures of those. In the network's output, they're attacked because the network generalized spatial features of the sample plane, not randomly appearing dust particles. It ignored them. In fact, it treated them as uh, some holographic artifact. This kind of a framework also works for denser samples. These are, um, these are uh, uh, thin tissue sections, breast tissue section in this case. The hologram is shown here. Network's output is shown here, beautifully resolving the features as if they're coming from the ground truth. Again, attacking some of these dust particles or other types of unwanted artifacts. So it takes um, a while uh, to uh, train this, but once trained, you can see that it's much faster compared to physics-based reconstructions. 
It requires less number of hologram acquisition, a single hologram is sufficient, and it's faster to uh, reconstruct that. Uh, you can also do some other very exotic tricks. In the interest of time, actually, um, uh, I want to uh, mention uh, that these are not just some uh, cool transformations that we're playing with deep neural nets. These holographic reconstructions powered by deep neural nets are also helping us to create better mobile instrumentation. For example, recently we created this imaging flow cytometer based on uh, holographic microscopy, which is a very inexpensive, label-free imaging flow cytometer that has a, a lot of throughput. It can screen about 100 milliliter to 500 milliliters of uh, liquid volume in about an hour. As objects are flowing, it can capture in a label-free manner colorful images of uh, uh, the, the algae and other things inside, inside uh, uh, your, your sample. This is a very inexpensive and, as you can see, portable system, entirely controlled and reconstructed by this laptop in real time. Uh, at large volume, this could be a few hundred dollars to put together. Currently, it costs us about $780, 700, uh, to $800 uh, to put together. So it's very cost-effective compared to a state-of-the-art cytometer, which would cost you uh, more than 50, 100K. This is really uh, helping us to uh, uh, enable some of these measurements to be done in the most resource poor settings. These are algae samples that are imaged in color in Los Angeles coastal line. We're very excited about this platform. Here, the reconstructions are powered by deep neural nets also. It's a large channel and we kind of reconstruct them uh, uh, right uh, in demand. This would be very useful for especially fishermen. Uh, in, for example, Chile in 2016, they lost about $800 million because of toxic algae killing fish. $800 million for Chile is a lot of money. The reason that they couldn't save their fish is because they didn't have technologies that could report the growth, rapid growth, blooming of algae. Because today, this is done by sampling water, sending it to a microbiology lab. They look under a microscope manually, send a report back. Expensive, slow and not very frequently done. Here actually you can have these uh, field portable devices, very inexpensive, do this routinely every day, every day, because of the throughput. This is another very uh, uh, interesting platform that's also powered by deep neural net based reconstructions. It's a label free bioaerosol detector. We've shown that this platform can with 94% accuracy, more than 94% accuracy, detect uh, different types of mold and different pollen types in a label-free manner without, without any expert in the loop, entirely based on holographic reconstruction based deep neural net followed by a classifier, also based on a deep neural net. Because we have morphology and be because we have color in this case, we have some very unique channels of information. This device has a throughput of about 13 liters per minute. Within a minute, we take from the nozzle here about 13 liters of, of air and deposit on a transparent substrate that tells us the contamination here at this point of the measurement in that 13 liters of, 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 of air. So these, these ideas of, of image reconstruction powered by deep neural nets are helping us to enable high throughput screening of very large volumes like air, water, and bodily fluids in very cost effective and field portable uh, manner uh, using these instrumentation. In the final um, Five minutes, if I can, I can, if I can, <laughs> I'd like to, uh, I'd like to finish with uh, some very other, uh, very uh, interesting uh, uh, um, uh, uses of deep learning. So one area which we've we've been exploring and very excited about is uh, transformations across different modalities. Let's say you have a microscope that's very expensive; it's a million dollars. I don't have access to that. Yes, it's very useful for you. You can see the nanoscale with it, but I don't have it. It's a million dollars. But I have another microscope, which is more cost effective. What if I could build a transformation between the, the, the two instruments based on the image that are coming from the, both, both of these instruments for the same set of samples and make my microscope work as your high-end microscope? We've shown that this is actually possible. You can take a confocal microscope and train it with STEP and show it to work uh, uh, as good as STED. 
For example, this is a recent article uh, that we published in Nature Methods that you can look at that is establishing this transformation between lower grade microscopy tools and super resolution microscopy tools like STED or structured illumination microscopy. This is actually a, a generalization to a, a, a sample, uh, like a, a drosophila embryo, that is imaged um, with SIM, where our neural net is only taking a standard fluorescence microscope to match the same performance. You can look at uh, this, this article uh, for further information. But this cross modality transformation is actually very, uh, very interesting, and it has some very unique applications in pathology. And I'll finish up by going over how these cross-modality, cross-microscope uh, transformations enabled by deep learning has been helping us to, to do some very unique transformations. Physics is very powerful. You can formulate a forward model from one type of a system to another one. But it cannot do what deep neural nets can do in this case. Because I'm going to establish a, a forward model without the understanding of physics between a fluorescence microscope and a bright field microscope. But the object also is going to change from a label-free sample to a labeled color sam sex, uh, sample. So not only the microscope modality is going to change, but the sample itself will change from label-free to label. So there's no, at least with our current understanding, there's no physical model to approach this transformation with some analytical or numerical modeling. It's only through data that you can establish this kind of statistical transformation. Why do we care? The specific example here is actually to to change the way that we do biopsies, pathology, it's the pathology. If you take today a biopsy from the patient during the surgery to understand tumor margin detection, or um, during, let's say, a, a routine inspection, what happens to this tissue sample is that it's cut into thin sections. And if you place that sub 10 micron thin section onto a bright field microscope, you cannot see any contrast. It's, it's like transparent. That's the reason why, for the last century or so, we've been using chemical staining to stain the, these tissue samples so that under a bright field microscope they look like this. This is the image of a bright field microscope after that tissue section has been stained by a histotechnologist. It takes sometimes two hours, three hours to do that staining. And this is what goes to a pathologist for his or her inspection. What if we could actually stop here? Take this unstained, unprocessed, label-free, stain-free sample and image it with a fluorescence microscope. Very simple UVX station. Um, just look at the fluorescence of the endogenous molecules embedded within tissue, whatever they are. You will get a black and white image. That's going to be transformed into actually, through a neural net, into a bright field equivalent of the same sample after its state. So you essentially change modality and change the type of sample here. For this, we're using a framework that is um, known as generative adversarial network. But it's not a traditional GAN. It's not a traditional generative adversarial network. In addition to some of the losses that come from the discriminator, you also have some regularization. Because the initial input here is already a microscopic image. It's not hallucinating because the input is a beautiful, high resolution, structurally confined microscopic image. Computer scientists, when we show them GAN results, they say, yeah, they hallucinate. Yeah, we've done that. 10 years ago, we've done that. 10 years ago, GANs didn't exist. That's first of all not true. A few years ago, it was created, yes. But those hallucinating GANs are not here because we, our input is not statistical modes. It's the real tissue morphology. So these are very confining conditional GANs. They do not hallucinate. In fact, we've done quantification of resolution, color distance, structural similarity index between ground truth coming from the pathology lab and our virtual stain ones, shown that they're very close to each other. But that doesn't satisfy a pathologist. Pathologists want to see things of interest to them. And that's why we had to do blind studies with a group of board certified pathologists. This is a very powerful framework <coughs> that surprised actually our group of colleagues from pathology. Let me show you some examples here. This is a salivary gland. 
HNE state. This is the only thing that goes into the neural net. DAPI filter, UVX station. This is a rapid, extremely fast virtual staining. And this is what, what comes after about an hour of processing at our pathology department. Beautiful match. This is another one. This is kidney, another type of stain, John stain. This is more exotic. It takes two to three hours and expensive uh, uh, labor of our histotechnologist. Again, DAPI channel input, beautiful staining, nicely matching the histologically stained <coughs> kidney tissue sections. Two other examples, liver, lung, a third stain type, Mason's trichome, also an exotic stain. Takes uh, about three hours in this case. Beautiful match between uh, vir virtually stained and histochemically stained ones. Again, quantification from engineering perspective, color distances, etc., are good initial point. But at the end, we were forced by our colleagues to create tables in a blinded study where we gave them virtually stained images coming from deep neural nets versus really stochemically stained ones. You, you know what? We fooled them. They could not understand the difference between the two. The stain quality measured um, with a table for nuclear detail, cytoplasmic detail, and extracellular fibrosis. There was no statistical significant difference between our results and theirs. At the same time, we did diagnostic analysis to conclude that there is no clinically significant difference in diagnosis achieved through virtual staining versus uh, uh, standard uh, histochemical staining. So from their perspective, this was, of course, a limited study. This was an academic study, so uh, we, 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 we are still continuing our evaluations with these blinded studies. But one thing that's very, very exciting about virtual staining is this standardization of um, uh, uh, stain. Let me give you an example. If you take, for example, liver and let's say Mason's trichome combination, give it to the same lab three times. This is the color tone variation that you get. This is the consistency problem. Just at UCLA, we have this top row showing the tones are changing. From country to country, region to region, this is going to be getting more wild. So, virtual staining help, helps us to kind of standardize the color tones and the staining quality that you get. That's very important for diagnosticians because diagnosticians are misled by these variations from lab to lab. Here, virtual staining will regularize that to help the training and, and success of diagnosticians. But more than that, it's also going to help downstream machine learning. If you want to train another layer of machine learning, to, to look at, for example, cancer stage determination. They would love to work with more consistent staining methods like, like these because it's going to help them train more um, accurately. So to conclude, um, this kind of a framework saves cost, saves expert labor and time. Very importantly, it standardizes the quality of the staining and it preserves tissue. You'd be surprised how many times you bring the patient back because we ran out of tissue. We finished the shit in the, the, in, the, in the standard method. You destructively cut it and <laughs> stayed it. You bring the patient sometimes back. I discussed it with our colleagues. Embarrassingly, they, they have to come, sometimes come, come back and take another chunk of tissue. Now we preserve it, and we can create from a single layer, untouched, virtual stains of multiple types. So you can do multiple types of stains to be virtually superimposed on the same sample while the sample is retained there, untouched. It's, it's, it's really very, very exciting. So all of this needs to be more and more and more validated for it to be clinically relevant. This was a study under IRB. We had patient uh, uh, data, obviously, but this was a, a relatively small study with, with UCLA IRB. We're now in the middle of expanding our validation with more clinical samples and getting more and more feedback from our diagnosticians to see where limits are and how we can improve this further. But as far as where we stand right now, the diagnosticians are more excited than we are. That's very interesting. They're more, we're exhausted with a lot of opportunities, right? You can do lots of things with coherent imaging, uh, sensing. I don't only work on pathology and applications in pathology, but they do only work in pathology, so they're more uh, focused and interested. They're driving us, essentially, uh, in this, in this uh, joyful uh, approach. So deep learning is helping us to create some unique transformations and reconstruction methods. Um, and um, 
It has implications for democratization of measurement science, microscopy, sensing, pathology, and I think this is an era where we will see a lot of new developments in instrumentation. Not just classification, segmentation, recognition. Instrumentation is fundamentally going to change through AI. And we're moving toward thinking instruments <laughs> that will be very data efficient, task specific, in the way that they sample data. Today's norm is sample as much as you can. We'll deal with it later. That's not a good strategy to conserve energy and your uh, mobile instruments need energy, whether it's wearable systems, implantable systems, or systems that work in the field. So, with this, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so impressive and so, so fascinating. The, the wizardry you're doing in your department and the, the opportunities that lie ahead. So before I open the floor for questions, just one question. I, I see you talk about both the imaging uh, capacity of the cell phone here, the computational capacity uh, of the cell phone, but also, if I understand correctly, the connectivity uh, capacity of the cell phone. Which, within these three areas or capabilities, would you see uh, have the most progress in the future? Or where would you see the most development? I think it's, it's like a pyramid. At the, uh, at the base, you have the uh, components. The, uh, the competitive nature of the components in terms of their in the case, for example, the optical interface, we're looking into um, um, a rapid evolution in, in the uh, CMOS um, uh, image quality and number of pixels. We did a study like a few years ago. We mapped out all the um, uh, cell phone cameras as a function of time and, and mapped their uh, megapixel count. It was a logarithmic growth. It was exactly following the Moore's law. So, for example, who would predict this? Mm -hmm. This is consumer demand for probably no reason, or very little uh, reason, <laughs> but, um, but we've seen that, and it's helping us rapidly move forward in certain directions mm -hmm. without our actually planning, without our uh, real uh, uh, vision. Uh, it's not driven by us. And that's the reason why we could barely see 10 years ago a red blood cell, but nowadays we can routinely see viruses, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So at the basis is the components that scientists enjoy um, and bring some of the things that in 80s, in 70s, it would cost us a 50k uh, grand. Some of these images that I showed for 70s researchers, 80s researchers, it would cost them a 50k grand to put together that instrument. Very easy. So at the base, it's the uh, instrumentation components. And then, of course, the computational, um, the app development is the, the graphical user interface and the beautiful... GPUs and, and other computational capabilities that we have here is, is, is wrapping around on that for system level. And then the top is the connectivity, and the connectivity is the part where you can, do, you can utilize it for epidemiology, okay. for data um, um, uh, exactly. stamping as a function of time and uh, space. And that's the, uh, the top, top level which kind of brings everything together for larger scale impact, especially for su uh, surveillance. Okay. Thank you. Do you have, uh, have any questions from the audience? So many questions. How do you interact with the tech issue? You have all these devices that could give enormous impact in the developing world. And the customers. Great, great How question. do you interact with the, with the stakeholders? Yeah, the stakeholders. Yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So there are two ways of doing it. One, in an academic setting. It's fair to say that I have uh, many collaborators in Sweden and in Europe. In, um, in other parts of the world. So I probably have 20 to 30 uh, other labs that work with us. Sometimes they come to our lab to take one of our devices after being trained. Sometimes through um, just digital means, uh, Skype, etc. We kind of work on designs for them to utilize in their own settings. Uh, a lot of our devices are being used in, other, in Africa and other settings uh, in different projects through these kinds of collaborations. So we have a huge network of uh, collaborators who are really helping us disseminate the impacts of these devices and we customize. A good chunk of my lab is working on literally uh, providing very low volume prototypes custom designed for certain applications and we're very open to that. And it's fair to say that li literally, if you count everything over the last 10 years, probably 40 different groups uh, in the world uh, came uh, in touch with us 
visiting us or, as I said, uh, through the remote connections. In addition to that, I'm also very interested in commercialization of these efforts because for sustainable impact, that's the way to go. You must have, for sustainable impact, uh, some element of business model to make it survive. So that's why some of these uh, uh, results that I've shown are in the stages of, um, in different stages of the commercialization path. Some of them are already products uh, being used for, um, for diagnostics. Some of them are products um, that are in maybe uh, relatively earlier stages and some of them are being planned. So I'm also a firm believer of uh, um, for-profit entities, not necessarily to be rich, but to make that sustainable. Philanthropy is great to, to kickstart the idea and the initial concept, generate the, uh, the idea and show the proof of concept. Academic settings are great to let others to test the idea and be more innovative with their own domains with our initial seed uh, uh, devices. But all of it will die if we cannot find ways to take them out in sustainable ways so that uh, less expert people without the PhDs can start using them. And that's where I think uh, some sort of a commercialization effort is, is very useful. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much. It's the best way to start the morning. Okay. And, uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to have the label-free mobile image flow psychometer. Okay. Yep. It's ready now. It's, yeah. like, it's a product, basically. Yep. Second, uh, I think you said uh, the cost was... I don't know what the cost was. Uh, that's how much I badly wanted. Uh, but they also said that that was the cost for, for the assembly. And that made me think, are you considering that the modality kind of way of providing this, that it's not a black box, another black box, smaller, cheaper, but still a black box, but having a, a module kind of based systems where you can, like a fair phone kind of thing, where you can exchange and upgrade and, and uh, have a multiple modality kind of thing to your instrument? Sure. It's a great question. So for, first of all, a, a conflict of this interest disclosure. I'm a co-founder of some of these companies and I have uh, uh, financial conflicts of interest that I need mm -hmm. to disclose. Uh, but th it doesn't affect my judgment. So, I'll <laughs> 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 so um, to answer your question, actually, uh, we are very eager, because this is a very early stage company in this, in this example of the imaging flow cytometer, this device over here. Um, that I shown earlier. Let me uh, go back to this one. So this one is, um, we have already a, a, an initial prototype with a certain set of features. But we're, because we're early stage, we're also eager to work with academic labs, um, uh, be part of their grants so that we can customize some of these features to your specific project. So those are also things that obviously we're very much interested in. Uh, uh, to find um, uh, uh, maybe you don't care about some of the features that we have here, but you care for some other features that will be uh, in, a, in a way uh, to discuss with you. Mm -hmm. uh, like light like, like scattering in addition to this, for example. Oh, yeah, I, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. But this also gives, already gives you light scattering, so I think, um, uh, yeah, we can talk in, in specific, but um, certainly we're very eager to work with uh, uh, the research community for profit, non profit university um, uh, research community for us to find better uses of this, this device mm -hmm. because it's a platform and it's very easy for us to uh, uh, repurpose it for different applications. One thing that we are very eager to uh, is really to give this to fish uh, in, in, uh, in Southern America especially because it's much needed. It's much needed. And those are the ones who do not have expertise to kind of uh, repurpose the device or talk to us. There it's really rugged black box that needs to work in the field, very resource poor settings. Um, that I believe is, is a huge impact globally. Even in, in Florida, it lost summer, summer of 2018. Florida lost 130 million roughly uh, because of algae bloom in one summer. So it's a huge problem happening everywhere. So we hear both affordability, but also flexibility to, for right. both fishermen and scientists uh, as a promise. Right. Uh, that sounds very, very exciting. Uh, so one last question, a quick one, because we're running a bit over time. As, as a medical cell biologist, I'm very curious to know about, I mean, this label-free staining, I mean, from a histologic perspective. So when you link it to the deep learning, 
I, I don't know much about it, but are you, so the learning curve in the deep learning part of it, is it based on the images that you know to be correct? Or could you perhaps discover, I mean, histology, I mean, all samples that you label or treat uh, are sort of distorted in a way? Absolutely, great question. This is a very good question, actually. So, we only have a few, two minutes to answer. Okay. So we'll, we'll so, have to say the rest of that. The ground the truth is indeed coming from the stained version. So what we do is this: we take the unlabeled uh, tissue from uh, our pathology lab, we image it with a fluorescence microscope, then it goes to uh, the lab back. This technologist stains it and gives it uh, uh, back to us. Sometimes we see that the tissue is distorted, uh, torn, flipped. We do not use those in our training because. Um, I've imaged the undistorted version. So what I'm learning is actually a, a transformation that is uh, never going to see the distortions that come from the regular lab, in a sense. Because uh, we image it without any uh, you know, physical uh, stress applied on the uh, tissue. Thank you very much. And uh, for the, we, we do have five minutes because we're going to reset the room for the following workshop here. Uh, we're running a bit over time, so we will uh, ask you to, to spend some time with uh, Professor Ostjan uh, while we rearrange here and get going as soon as we can. But for now, a big hand, a warm hand. Thank you very much. For, uh, <laughs> Uh, I would like to also remind uh, the, the, you on Facebook and you here that on September 11th we'll have uh, the bridge interview with Tom Erickson, the CEO of uh, Alpha Laval at, in Malmö, at Malmö Studio. Uh, on uh, September 19th we'll have the next bridge talk, number 19, with Gotham uh, Ramderai from Google. And on October 8th and 9th, 2020 will run the next bridge summit here at Medicom Village actually and because of that there will also be a special uh, site focus on life science so uh, and also I would like to remind you all of you if you like what we do at bridge uh, forum uh, we encourage you to become members of the network so please visit our sites and uh, and uh, join our future events thank you very much for coming Thank you. Thank you.